Okay, so we are online. So good evening, everybody. I'm Roberto Reale, and tonight we have uh, Rufus Pollock. Which Rufus is a, a globally recognized expert on open data, open knowledge, is the founder of the Open Knowledge Foundation, he is also a very well known author. Um, his book, The Open Revolution, is, I think, uh, a, um, a milestone. Uh, at global level about you know, the um, development of an open society. And we have Flavio Marzano, who is the yes. former um, uh, Flavia uh, Council member in Rome yes. about innovation and uh, how can we say in English, uh, uh, simplification, I mean, <laughs> Uh, More simplification, participation, and smart city, and open agenda, and yeah. uh, digital agenda, stuff like that. I, technologies for public administration, let's say. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Um, Rufus, uh, the title of this meeting is uh, Robot Revolution for the One Person. Uh, why uh, is this a real danger? I mean, is the, the idea that we will have a revolution only for the top 1%, how can we avoid that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now. So first of all, just to really, um, Big thank you uh, to you, Roberto, and to you, Flavia, and uh, for inviting me here today. It's a real uh, privilege to be speaking to you and to the audience out there. So I want to talk, I mean, I think there are many ways into the topic and, and we can explore different aspects, but I think I want to focus on one very concrete because as a maybe preamble, you know, open data can seem you know, or, or the topic of openness can be seen as kind of like a niche thing, or it's about innovation, or it's about technology, or it's about this specific area. Uh, that's kind of, you know, important, but sort of narrow or special, specialized. Um, it's not the kind of thing that when you go down to the cafe, I mean, I know we're in COVID times, or you go to the restaurant, or you talk to your mother, or your daughter, or your brother, or your sister, it's not the kind of thing you normally talk about, you know, with ordinary people. It can seem sort of like niche. Um, and I want to try and show today a little bit that this is really kind of the question about openness and maybe open data, but openness of information. That is by openness, I mean information that is freely uh, shareable, usable, buildable upon by anybody for any purpose. Um, um, at least at the point, the immediate point of having it, um, which contrasts with how much most information is today, which is that you need permission from someone. Someone has basically a, a monopoly right of some kind of that information. Um, the closed world win, but this is like profoundly relevant to the, the most everyday uh, and, and kind of important subjects, starting with inequality, but also directly connecting to um, the major political uh, changes, you know, the election of Donald Trump and other things like that um, in 2016. Um, and even what's going on today where, you know, still almost half of American, you know, very large proportion of the electorate voted for Donald Trump in the last election, um, for example, the US, but also changes we're seeing across many societies. So I wanna talk about the hidden cause of growing inequality. Um, I wanna start with a story and it's a true story. It's a story of a man called Mr. Frisbee, uh, who is real despite his wonderful name. And Mr. Frisbee was born in Florida in 1963. And when he was 15 years old, he left uh, school and he went to work in an agricultural machinery business uh, just south of Tampa. And he worked there for the next 30 years. And then one day he took the savings he'd made and this is the early, you know, mid 2000s. He started his own business, which was a scrapyard and metal earth working workshop. And it was called American Dream Welding and Fabrication. And it's such a great name because if you like, he is symbolizing that. 
He's trying to weld back together the American dream that is breaking apart in his lifetime. Because in his, in, in, in the period that he's been growing up and working, his version of the American dream is breaking down. The world he grew up in, the jobs he grew up in, the blue collar industrial sector all disappearing. And when the recession comes in 2009, he is really struggling. He goes from six employees to just two, him and his stepson. His partner who works at a daycare center gets fired and he starts to get angry. He starts to resent other people's success. Why are they doing okay when I'm struggling? Because his world is not working. And then we come to 2016. He's angry, he's dispossessed. The government are making him put up some stupid fence around his business. He's still struggling and he's someone who's gonna vote for Donald Trump. He's gonna vote at least for someone who is giving him some kind of answer, however true or not it is. The thing I want you to look at is that he epitomizes the growing inequality of the United States. In fact, maybe the world at large. He may seem one man, but he represents millions. The bottom 60% of Americans, and that is 180 million people, have barely seen their real income rise since the 1970s. They have nearly the same wages today as 50 years ago in real terms. Even more dramatically, that same 60% of Americans, the same 180 million people, have seen their real wages drop since 1999, between 1999 and 2016 at that point. They're actually poorer in 2015 than they were in 1999. And that's never happened before in the history of the United States. And meanwhile, the share of the richest people, the top 1%, the top 5%, have risen dramatically. And that's what makes it so tough for Mr. Frisbee. If everyone were having a half time, you could maybe understand. But when you watch a few people at the top getting rich and you're struggling, then you get angry. And the thing is, it's no longer just Mr. Frisbee, the blue collar guy. It's people in the middle classes who are really struggling, who worry about job security, worry if their job will get outsourced offshore or replaced by AI, by AI and whether they will still be needed. And so there's a direct connection between that growing inequality and the political instability we're seeing today. And this isn't just about the US. This growing inequality is happening all over the world right now. It's happening in Italy, it's happening in France, it's happening in the UK, it's happening in Germany, it's happening in China. So we need to ask ourselves, what's causing this growing inequality? What's behind this and what can we do about it? Because something, it's something systematic. It's, it's, inequality is growing everywhere and we've been missing I would suggest the real source of it. And today we're gonna to to discover that hidden source together. And what we will see is that there is a direct connection between the rise of digital technology and this growing inequality. Now this may sound surprising. After all, digital technology has brought incredible innovation and progress. And it isn't te digital technology on its own that is causing this growing inequality. Rather, it is the combination of digital technologies, costless copying, with the mistaken and inappropriate use of old rules of exclusive ownership in the form of patents and copyrights that is causing inequality, political instability. Now to understand what's happening, let's take a step back to think about what is going on for Mr. Frisbee. And at this moment, I also wanna illustrate that, that this, what I'm gonna go through, which is in many ways extremely simple, um, is also the key to understanding a lot of other things that are going on in the digital world or in our world today. Um, so I want to start maybe with a little bit of an illustration um, to talk through a little bit of this maybe, which is um, if, if you can imagine, and I might just try and put it up here. Let me see if I can... I can share screen, is that right? Can you do it, Rufus, or is, it... is that okay? Can I share screen? Yeah, yeah sure, I... sure, sure. I don't know if... Uh, I think the host, you've disabled it for... for... Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll check that. Let yeah. Let me just check, because... So what in I'm... the meantime, in the meantime, sorry, uh, just to say you that, unfortunately, uh, I, I 
could not stay more much longer, Rufus, and I'm I'm very well, very happy to be to see you again after such mm -hmm. a long time. And uh, I would like to thank you, thank you very much for being here with us and talking about such an interesting topic because uh, you know the battle of openness is not over yet, you know. So we have to it's still. Not over. It's not over. That's for sure. We have to 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 find some more, not just in Italy or in Europe, in whatever. So thank you very much indeed. That I'm sorry, but uh, I have to leave now. Thank, thank you, Flavia. Well, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Rufus, you should be able to share your screen now. Great. Okay. Um, so let me. Okay, so what we want to start with is, um, if I just, um, uh, if I just do my sharing, oh. second there we go okay I don't know whether that's going to work well with keynote let's have a look there we go um oh there we go yeah okay so i want to start with us looking at what's different about digital um so there's a really profound and very simple shift here and it's, I think, becoming, I hope, kind of increasingly obvious, but I really want to spell it out together today. Can you see my screen, by the way? Sure, um, sure. For some reason, it's saying to me that the sharing is paused. Please bring your sharing window to the front. So you can see the, the slides. Yeah, the, the first one. What's different about digital? Ah, okay, I've moved to the next slide. So there seems to be some... Well, you, you can try You can try to move. Oh, okay, okay, directly inside the... I think I think some reason when I go to this, it's it's, it's going to tell me that sharing is paused. Please bring your shared window to the front. But Rufus, you, you could try, yeah, just share I'll them just, I'll this just way. Do I think I'm just going to do it this way, which is fine. Yeah. Um, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so what's different about this. So we have here, we have a banana, we have a video, we have a pharmaceutical, like a pill. So what's different about that? Um, um, you'd want to ask yourself. So I, I normally I'd like it would be good to ask people here uh, to, on that front. Um, so what's different? So one is that basically the, the pharmaceutical and the medicine are both made out of information. I mean, obviously, it is the case that the banana at some level is made out of DNA, but in terms of digital information, the video and the pill, while you might think of it, it, it physically is made of something, the main key ingredient of a pharmaceutical is the information, the, the recipe of it. So what, in what way though is this different? What makes that different? Well, okay, well, how much does it cost to make the first of these? Well, let's imagine to make the first copy of a banana or having one banana is a euro. You know, you can go, maybe it's a bit less. It's a few 50 cents or something, but it, let's say it's a euro. The first copy of a, the first version of a, a film is, is 10 million euros. And let's say a pharmaceutical, it might be less, it might be more, but let's say it's hundred million euros. The question then is, well, how much does it cost to make the next, like the next banana or the next, the next film, copy of that film and so on. And what we can see is that it, it's this dramatic difference, which is the cost to make another banana is basically the same. The cost to make the, the, uh, the next film copy is a cent, let's say, that's the cost of streaming of the internet, and the cost to make another pill, like the physical cost of manufacturing the fracturing plant with its chemicals is, is one euro. So there's kind of this ratio, I mean, either a, like the, with normal things made of atoms, we have this one-to-one -one kind of ratio of cost. On the film, in this case, actually it's a billion to one, or on the pill, it's like a hundred million to one. But basically it's like 
almost costless, essentially, that to make the next copy. So what's really different about digital is that the cost of making an additional copy is essentially nothing compared to the, co the original copy. So in this way, movies and shoes are different in this fundamental way. Um, if I, if I want to make a copy of a movie, if you want to watch a movie at the same time as me, it's almost costless to do that. But if you want to wear my shoes at the same time as me, it's going to be very uncomfortable. So there's this really profound way in which they're different. And so we have been living in a world of atoms. We've been living for thousands or millions of years in a world of bananas and of shoes and of physical things that are made as atoms. Now we're gonna keep on living on that, but in terms of the economy, more and more of what is value, what generates value, what we pay for, what we trade, what we create is information. So we're moving into a world of bits and we used to live in a world of atoms and bits are free to copy while it's expensive to copy atoms. And this changes everything. So I call this sometimes is a joke, the plate tectonics out of people like of the digital age. Well, so what I mean by that is that once you have this simple kind of idea and we're then gonna take a little bit further, you can explain a lot. So if you think about plate tectonics, before this point, you were like, why are this, this pattern of volcanoes or earthquakes all over the world? Why do they happen in this place? There was no real, like, there, you know, like you just look at this map and it would just, oh, you know, sort of, they seem to be connected. There seemed to be a chain of them, but why, you know, what's going on? And what we now know is obviously there are these plates and there's this underlying explanation that's very simple, that's quite powerful. It would predict where volcanoes will happen. It even explains how they come about. It doesn't tell us when, I do want to emphasize that. It doesn't tell us when they may happen because pressure builds up, pressure builds up, like inequality, like Trump, pressure, the, the pressure of inequality on our society been building up, building up, and then it erupted into something. Um, and so we don't necessarily know that. And that's the same with digital. Digital is gonna create patterns, but where, so when things will happen is, is, less, is less clear, you know? And so, you know, here we have the rise of populism you know, which is a, a universe, quite a global phenomenon. Um, and it's a lot of it related to this growing inequality and insecurity. So I want to add a couple more things though to our plate tectonic story then that we had. So one was that, um, and I'm going to stop kind of sharing for a moment here um, and come back. So one is that, you know, as I said, it's the combination of costless copying with something else. And I want to walk us through that and how that then directly relates to the reality of like millions of people uh, and that, you know, who are, and the, the kind of economics and the social developments we're seeing. So, you know, if we look in most countries, we, we and let's say go back to Mr. Frisbee, he sees his kind of job disappear, blue collar or industrialized, industrial work disappears and he becomes one of the dispossessed with a you know precarious livelihood a precarious job um, economic insecurity and resentment often out of that um, you know and we can think of previous eras you know the 1920s and 1930s <laughs> um, sometimes for these and at the same time during his lifetime starting in the 1970s we see the rise of the modern information economy so intel is founded in 1968 when frisbee is five years old when he's 12, Bill Gates will drop out of Harvard to go and start Microsoft. The following year, Jobs and Wozniak will start Apple in his garage in Silicon Valley. Now you might sit there and say, well, okay, there's always been change. Horses replaced motor cars. People who had horse businesses went out of business. That's normal, right? But in a market, and that's, you know, in a market economy, there's always change and there's always some people who are losing out and some who are gaining. But there's something different now. Well, I have a question now. Yeah. But because we have a sort of riddle, I mean, information is not driven, can be yes. copied and shared you know, almost without cost. Yes. Yet we have just a very, very small group of people who are making money out of information at a global level. 
and yes. everybody else is not. Yep. But, yeah. I mean, how why is that? that so? Because. Well, that's what's different. You've got to ask about that. So, where, you know, let's kind of like, so when Mr. Frisbee's in the past, let's say there was this innovation, things got replaced, cars replaced horses. His job, you know, when he gets replaced, he's getting replaced not by somebody else, but by a robot. And what's different about that, right? Because people still make robots. Well, there's something fundamentally different. And to see that, I want to think of an, amount, you know, an analogy. And so this, so to, to really understand why this, the change to an information age is so profound in terms of why is it that then a few people make money because there's a lot of value being generated, like more value than ever before. And so I want you to think about that the economy is like a running race. Consider that there are different types of running races. For example, at my school, we had a running race where there wasn't a single winner, where everyone who finished in under two hours was a winner. And everyone who'd done that had made it. Now that's what the old economy was like. Now think about it, and I want to kind of pursue this analogy further. Imagine you're in the old days an apple farmer, Roberto, and you grow apples. And sure, there are some farmers who are better and there are some who are worse, but everyone who does an okay job growing apples is going to make a living. And, or let's say you're in a car factory and we make cars. Yes, there are some workers who are faster at doing their job and there's some who are slower. Um, but if you make it do a decent job, you make a living, you earn a wage. And it's also true that if you're an owner, yes, there are other car factories, but if you do a decent job as an owner, you'll make money selling your cars and you'll make a living. So there's a decent free market system working right there. But then what's happened is we got to a shift to an economy that's like a race where there's just one winner. And it's all about who comes first. Because if you win that race, you get all the prize money, all the value and everyone else, it doesn't matter where they came. Now, why is that like the digital economy? Because in a digital economy, the fundamental central massive change is costless copying. Once I've got one copy of Windows software, I can give a copy to everyone on the planet at the touch of a button. Once I've got a copy of a movie or a copy of a database, I can reproduce for practically everyone. So where we have a situation where one person can apply, supply everyone on the planet. And that's very different. To go back to our example of the apple farmer for a minute, there's a limit on how many apples you or I could supply, Roberto. So no matter how good you were, I could still sell my apples if I did a good, decent job. You can't supply everybody. That means I can be farming apples, you can farm apples, someone else can be farming apples, we make our living. But suppose one day there's an apple farmer named Mr. Gates and Mr. Gates, one night, this old witch comes to the door of Mr. Gates, says, Mr. Gates, if you'll give me 10 gold coins, I will sell you this magical apple seed. Mr. Gates thinks about it and he goes, okay, I'll take the risk. And he gives her the 10 gold coins, plants the apple seed. The next day, there's this incredible apple tree. And Mr. Gates's apple tree can produce unlimited number of apples, millions and millions of apples. And suddenly Mr. Gates can supply everyone with his apples that cost him nothing. So he can then undercut everyone else. He can sell at a price that no other apple farmer can match. And suddenly he can dominate the entire apple market and everyone else goes out of business. And that's what's going on. The real world Mr. Gates, once he has the Windows operating system, he dominates. He supplies everyone in the world, it costs him nothing. Now, there might be a few options. There might be a few different flavors of magical Apple. There might be Linux and there might be Microsoft and there might be Apple, but there will be very, very few. So you can dominate them. And that's what we're seeing. These incredible floppies like May, Facebook, Windows, Google. I know Windows is getting old now, but before, and you know, they may sometimes be replaced. Like suddenly there's a new flavor of, of pear that everyone wants instead of the old Apple. But essentially, then the pair dominates. And in every vertical that you look at, you have this monopoly or something close to it. Now, there is something to add to this because it's not just an issue of infinite costless copying. That's amazing. We can suddenly supply everyone on the planet with free apples or free educate, you know, free software or whatever. But it's that there's a single person who has conclusive ownership and control of that material. Because Mr. Gates, the farmer, has exclusive control of his apple tree. 
Just as Mistigate, the real Mistigate has exclusive control, or Microsoft, Mistigate is Microsoft, has exclusive control of, of Windows. And that's what's crucial because we could have a story where Mr. Gates' magical apple tree is shared with everyone. Everyone has apples. But no, we've created rules that give people exclusive ownership and control. And there is a logic to that. I want to emphasize, it costs money to create the apple tree. It costs money to create windows. It creates costs money to create a movie. It creates, costs money to create the first recipe of a great drug. So we know that. And so as a society, what we thought is, okay, we've got to have a way that the original innovators, the original creators make their money back or are rewarded. And that's absolutely kind of correct. We do need that. So what we've done though, is we, what we thought is the only way really to do that was to give out these monopoly rights, to give out copyright and patents that give someone exclusive monopoly control of these pieces of software, these databases, and that, has had, I mean, first of all, I'm going to come there are alternatives, but there's also been this massive unintended side effect. The result of running the new economy on these old rules of exclusive ownership and control has been incredible sparring inequality. When Mr. Bezos has like, I don't know, hundreds of billions, more money than maybe half the rest of the planet. You know, in 2016, it was estimated the eight richest people in the world had as much money as the bottom 50% of humanity. That's three and a half billion people. And of those eight, six of them are tech billionaires. Now, 40 years ago, not one of the richest people was in tech. So the question that we face is, can we do something different? Can we have a way of rewarding and recognizing creators and innovators so that we have new software, new films, new drugs, new novels, new designs for airplanes, whatever you name it, without that necessarily resulting in this kind of incredible concentration of power and wealth that is dangerous to our societies, that's dangerous to our political stability, that's dangerous um, to our freedom of enterprise and our, our freedom of thought, can we do that? And the answer is we can. And that brings me, and I don't want to pause here, but that brings me to the, the second part, which is how do we how do we do that? And the answer. So, so that, 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 that that's what you you, you know you 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 discuss in your book, by the way. Yes. Uh, the open evolution, which is yes. which is something I suggest, strongly suggest everybody. To, to, to read, to peruse, to study, but uh, apart from that, I also, uh, well, I also another, have another question here about the, uh, about how, I know that that's the second part of yeah. what I talk about, uh, when it comes to how. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, are we sure that we only need data, uh, we only need to give up, um, I mean, exclusion of rights on data, or do we also need uh, you know, tools, infrastructure to manage data? Because for example, in the case of Mr. Bezos, it's not only, I think, it's not only the huge amount of data he has access to, but it's also the huge physical infrastructure he uses to manage that data. Yeah. Do you think this is something we can get rid of? Or I think it's a little bit subtle, like, so, so we could talk about Mr. Bezos. I mean, I think it's easier to think clearly through these, these questions. Um, so I think it's easier to proceed a little bit by little bit. I mean, there's two parts. So, so In the case of, of Amazon, so, so many of the tech monopolies actually combine a, a second aspect that kind of supports their monopoly along with costless copying. Costless copying sort of allows it, but there's a second point, and that's what I would call the platform effect or the marketplace effect. So going back, even before the digital world, um, I don't know, I mean, I'm talking to Italians here, but if you think of, your, of, of, a, of a city, most of, if you live in a city in Italy or you live in any city actually in the world, it may be less relevant now, but if you would go around your city, you'd find that there was probably 
maybe one major marketplace. So at some point, there was a place where people came to buy and sell vegetables or buy and sell fish. And normally there was only one of these in your city. There weren't like 20 of them. Um, for example, while there were maybe many, many um, bakeries, there are lots of bakeries in your city or lots of restaurants, just like there are many apple farms, there aren't lots and lots of marketplaces. There is a sort of scale effect of a marketplace where you want marketplaces become kind of what I'd call the law of one. There's often only one of them or a very few of them um, because there's this benefit of having lots of buyers and lots of sellers. So you see it with the stock market. In Italy, there'll probably be one major stock market originally in Milano. Even now, as digital technologies come along, there's probably even one major stock market in Europe or in, 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 in the US. Like there's not like in every city. So, uh, or in every country even, it's kind of moved beyond the country. So there's a second layer of, of monopoly that sort of kind of monopoly or tendency to standardize it to one, which is then monopoly if it's owned by exclusively in a platform. And I've got another essay about that called Ubernomics, which talks through that. Now those two often, let's say in the case of Facebook, the case actually of Google, um, to some extent, actually, the case of Microsoft, the case of, 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 of Amazon, you have these platform effects as well as cost as copying. Um, um, so the, the thing is that the, the, the way to solve that um, kind of also goes back to the cost as copying point, which is this, the point about, I mean, Amazon's actually slightly complicated. So I want to come to that because you talked about them having physical infrastructure. But let's talk about something like Facebook, because it's actually an mm. easy example that is also a platform. There's lots of, it's kind of connecting people through this platform. Um, think of the internet. So the internet was also a platform. It was also a network for connecting people originally, like through email, or through websites and so on. And that is, there is the one, there is only one internet. Um, we don't have multiple competing networks anymore. There were once competing networks, but there's now one but it's not owned exclusively by anyone. It's kind of the internet is open. Anyone can freely, anyone can get the protocols, can download the protocols and software to implement those protocols to connect to the internet and can run their own server. You don't need permission to connect. But if I wanna to connect to Facebook, I need permission from Facebook. I cannot also write software that would connect Facebook to other systems, to another social network. So what you see there is that we have a solution because of the cost of copying of information, we could make the protocols open. We could make the software open that runs those systems and then allow multiple networks to interconnect. So I think my point, if you were coming finally to Amazon, so Amazon is made up of several parts, but let's take books. I mean, ultimately, how do I put it? If you even go on Amazon today, often they're not even shipping you the book. They have simply become a dominant marketplace for where I find the books. And then there's some, often other people are even doing the shipping, right? Like it's not, it's yeah, not them. I mean, even if it were them doing the shipping, you could kind of separate the fulfillment arm, the arm that does the delivery from the marketplace arm. And what you would then do on the marketplace arm is you would basically either make it open, you'd make it open source, or you'd regulate it. You'd say, okay, there is going to be a single marketplace for buying books online. You know, or very few. I mean, other people can create them, but we are going to make sure the transaction fee is very low. And I now know if you buy my book through Amazon, they charge something like 40% of that price. I mean, it is incredible. For basically, they don't even print it. They don't really even often deliver it much. It's like they, they take off this incredible charge of being in the middle. And that's what you could go after, which is you'd say, okay, well, we're going to have a platform like the internet we're going to have a marketplace even. It's even more like the internet. It's going to be even a main place that we go and transact, but it's going to not be, um, it's not going to be, um, um, it's not going to be monopolized. I mean, that's the really simple answer. It would be the same thing happened with stock markets. At one point, maybe there was an entity that controlled the stock market, charged buyers and sellers a lot of money whenever they transacted in a share because you had to go there to do the transaction. Well, the way to solve that is to regulate the transaction fee or whatever. So you could say, look, Amazon, you can only charge 3% when you act as this middle person. Yeah. So, so Amazon is sort of challenging something for the right to access 
that their marketplace. Yes, I mean, it's it, 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 like if you had a fish it's, market or if I have, I mean, I think of other examples yeah. you can think of where you're like, you have some inclusive control of a valuable place to kind of transact. It, it, that, you know, that's yeah. famously, famously it was certain cities. There were certain cities in the middle ages where people would come together to have a market, the, the grand fairs. And obviously yeah, you made a lot true. of money taxing that if you were in charge of that. Well, yeah. And, and about the middle ages, about history, you know, that, that kind of scenario reminds me of, you know, the enclosures in British history. Uh, I don't know you have you know, uh, just I don't know, like the enclosure that... analogy because unfortunately, from an economic history point of view, enclosures were probably a good thing. Um, they weren't. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, don't yeah. like it because <laughs> yeah. this analogy between the physical commons. I mean, just just to go on that, I'm sorry to <laughs> jump in on that one, but it's like, um, like basically, um, like you have things like this that I don't I don't like so much, which which confuse the issue where you see people going around saying like data is like water. You know, this is a this is actually from this is from an event that was about open information, and they're like data is the groundwater of the information society. And like, no, it's not like water. It's not like oil. It's not exclusive. It's not like land. The commons enclosure movement around land is fundamentally different from the, the commons discussion about information. They are fundamentally different. One is a rival good that can be overused by the commons, by people using it. And one is a good that cannot be overused. You cannot overuse information. And where the issue is that we're enclosing it as a way of funding the production of it. In the case of commons problems, for example, with the climate change or with other fundamental commons problems, they're about overuse of a rival or a scarce resource. Now, some of the mechanisms for management may be similar, but the problem is, is fundamentally different. It's, it's, one, it's a mirror image problem. Like it's, not, it's not about rivalry. Data isn't scarce. It, once it's created, it's abundant. The problem is how to resource the creation of it. How do you pay people to make data in the first place, um, as it were, or to collect it or to organize it? Um, and that's, that's where you need something like remuneration rights. I want to come to the second point. So I'm sorry to jump in there, but yeah, I don't like the enclosure analogy. Jamie Boyle makes it, and I mean, Jamie Boyle is a brilliant, I've had so, I've gained so much from Jamie Boyle. He's a brilliant person, um, but I, and, and so and other people, but I don't, I think that analogy is really misleading for people because it goes back to the, yeah. the physical, like, like yeah, yeah. I guess you're you point. got the book. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, Rufus, please. Um, I, I do have a, a lot of questions about, uh, you know, about your model yeah. of, of the knowledge, because, for example, right now in, in Italy, we have this public debate going on about opening up the data about vaccines. Yeah. About vaccines, about the, about the vaccination plan, national vaccination plan. Uh, but also about you know um, also about the level of um, this is spreading in the, in the you know in the Italian regions and we are asking we are as a, a, you know, a, a community as the open data community in Italy we are asking the government to provide raw data and I know that you you were the pioneer about open about all data. I know that Berners-Lee also, you know, uh, always credit you with that. And uh, but this is something we, we, we find hard to communicate because, and also we, we are find it difficult to to, uh, to, uh, to to push the government towards uh, you know opening up the raw data. Yeah. Um, do you have some suggestion about that? Yeah. How can we? Uh, yeah. with Let this? me answer. I mean, let, first of all, just for people, because I want to get clear for people kind of coming in, maybe just first of all, is just to very quickly set out the remuneration rights idea and then come to this question, which is a question really about transparency. So, first of all, I want to like what I want to emphasize uh, maybe is, is what do we mean by an open revolution? Like, what, what, would that mean? And what I want to kind of emphasize about that is it, it's a world in which all digital innovation is open and innovative creators are recognized and rewarded. So 
all the software, all the algorithms, all the content, all the data that's non-personal, that isn't personal information, is open and free for anyone to use, build on and share. And we basically, public funding, where we have like, you know, public funding in universities or we have research funding, that would continue and we replace patents and, uh, I should put an R, uh, we replace patents and copyrights with remuneration rights. Now, what are remuneration rights? So the way to think about this is the best analogy, and it's now maybe showing my age for some people in, if there are young people, is in the, imagine when we moved even to iTunes. So in the first version of music set up online, you'd buy, still buy track. You'd pay 99 cents to get a track. And then came along Spotify or other services like that, that we now have. In those models, you pay a fixed fee and then you have unlimited access. You can access all the tracks on the platform as much as you want. And remuneration rights are a bit like that. There's a, they're not quite Spotify because they're an open Spotify, the open spot, if you like. Um, but uh, they're like that in that the key thing is in a remuneration right, you as a person, we still have to pay innovators and creators, right? So the money, we, but we don't pay per use now. That's why we can now have so much more usage, but we still pay. So what would be go on? It's something like everyone, to speak it simple, let's say everyone in Italy would say, okay, everyone is going to pay one euro or maybe 50 cents a month on their phone bill, on their mobile bill. And that money would go into a fund that would be organized, it would probably the government would coordinate it, but it would be independent of the government. It wouldn't be part of governance ready. It would be an independent entity that was like, you know, there was a, a board who supervised it. And the money would go in and then that money would be distributed by basically an algorithm. It wouldn't be like up to any, like it would be literally supervised, but basically an algorithm that would say, I'm gonna, we're gonna get an estimate. We're gonna go out and statistically estimate by maybe surveying people, how much, what music people listen to. And then we would give out the money in that fund based on what music was listening to how much. So let's say, for example, there's 100 million euros a year in that fund. And then I don't know, I'm going to make sense, but like 5% of all the tracks played in Italy last year are, I don't know, the Beatles. Then 5% of that money would go to the Beatles. Now, what you've got in this model that's amazing is you're still paying the Beatles or you're still paying the new recording artist. And you are, um, but as an Italian, you have, you can put, listen to any music as much as you want, whenever you want, you can build on it, you can reuse it, you can share it, etc. cetera. Um, and that's a remuneration, right? So it, it no longer has the monopoly right aspect where we're restricting usage, but, and we have a way to pay uh, creators. And it's, and it's similar to what we're already doing. Spotify is already sort of doing that, except that you pay Spotify and they take a whole chunk of that money. In this model, you, it's like the government does the licensing problem. It takes care of the collective licensing. And you could do the same thing for pharmaceuticals. So we call that Spotty Pharma. And there's a whole, um, there's a whole project about that called IMED Project. Um, it, if I just, um, um, uh, if you look here, you know, you can see there's, a, there's the IMED Project, which is about this model for medicines. And, you know, what, how this goes, if I just walk it through, it's maybe even clearer here. So we create two payment streams for medicines. We, one is to pay for the R&D and one is to pay for the actual manufacture of the medicine. And the one for the R&D is much the bigger, yeah? The one for the medicines is really small the, because actually manufacturing is about, you know, maybe 1%, yeah. 5%. Now, how does the R&D payment stream work? So we create this remunerations right fund and we each pay this fixed amount. Like, in, like in, let's think of even for COVID, we'd have all paid into a fund as, a, as an Italian that money would be put in the fund and then that would get paid or it would come from our healthcare insurance or from the government. And then it would go into this fund. And then when it lets a pharmaceutical company invented a vaccine for COVID, they wouldn't have any patent on it. They would just get the right to get paid depending on how many people use that vaccine and how useful it was. They'd get this remuneration right instead of a patent right. And this entitles them to get paid. But then anyone could have manufactured the vaccine as much as they wanted, if they wanted to. Right. So and, and, and particularly in the pharmaceutical case, it's good to emphasize it's not pay on usage. It's based on the actual medical benefits. So you'd have to estimate how much, you know, how many people took the COVID vaccine and how useful it was compared to other pharmaceuticals that were invented that year. And then you would pay out based on that. 
yeah um so that you know this is um so how do we technically distribute the money so this is the kind of approach and you see it already, we already have in a way implemented this approach with Spotify or even a bit like Netflix and in certain other cases. I mean, in fact, there was an example in Australia where the government for a very successful drug basically just paid a fixed amount of money. They gave a billion dollars to the pharmaceutical company and then said, we want as many, we want to be able to treat as many patients as we want. We're not gonna, we're not gonna buy per treatment. We're just gonna pay a fixed fee and then we can treat as many people as we want. And that's the kind of approach, what I call this all you can eat type model, your fixed fee, unlimited uses. Um, and that's the essence of a remuneration right. Um, now to come to your question about transparency and the, the, the data about COVID, there's the kind of a question that it's really less about this economic point, it's more about a transparency question because the government aren't selling that data. Sure, they're, not, sure. they're, not having, it's not, they're not charging. Now that's, a diff, like, that's really a deep question of what access. Now I don't know why the government of Italy is not publishing that data. Often people are, there's a, just a human tendency to secrecy. Like we all, we don't want people to kind of like, you know, it, it takes some courage sometimes to be able to share because we think we might get criticized. And that doesn't matter whether you're, you know, an ordinary person or you're a bureaucrat in the government, it's an understanding reaction. So normally I try and bring compassion to understand the government and say, listen, we, you know, we understand that you're worried. Can you tell us what you're worried about? You know, maybe you could talk to us about what, what it is you're worried about would happen if you did publish this data. And look at all the good things that might happen if you publish this data. Maybe, you know, people would do extra research for you. Maybe people would um, be able to innovate better. Maybe people would come up with novel ways of, you know, um, self-isolating or making, being careful. You know, I don't know, but I think you have to go and use that kind of carrot and what I call the carrot and compassion, not the carrot and the stick, the carrot and the compassion. Now, if that really doesn't work, you can always get out the stick and say, look, this is outrageous. This looks, you know, what are you doing hiding this information? <laughs> but I prefer always to come with the compassion of it's hot. No, it's not easy to share. You know, when you're a kid, sharing means less. When you're a child and someone says, share your cake with that other child, be nice. That means less cake for me. <laughs> so sharing isn't natural in that regard. So we have to learn that we're in a world of infinite cake rather than limited cake. And that's what we have to bring compassion to government on that. Well, that's, that's a really good way of looking at it. Compassion is totally something we did not try, honestly. But, uh, you know, in some way, they, uh, they, they don't want probably to, uh, to publish raw data because that will, you know, will be, that will mean giving up too much, too much, too much power, too much knowledge, too much, too much right to, to, to hide. Because probably the Italian way of, you know, of doing politics is also, uh, it's also being able to hide things. So if I publish them, if I publish, uh, if I publish your data, if I publish everything, probably I'm, feel not empowered anymore. I mean, from a government point of view. Uh, for a second, not I hear you. Probably you are mute. Oh, I saw I yeah. mean, somehow muted myself. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, people may. Do you hear me? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Thing, I agree. I think people can feel, but I'd always be like, talk to people's greatness if you can, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's probably something we, we have to try. And going back to your model for a moment, uh, I, 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 get, I get also that we need to, to have a remuneration model in, in place and you explain that also in your book but I, I when I think about models like uh, Amazon again uh, we all know that the which, business which, which model sorry Amazon yes like Amazon yeah yeah so we all know that Amazon makes money not 
not only for not only from you know selling goods, selling material goods, but also from oh me oh probably mainly from selling um, computational power, from selling uh, space in the cloud. And that's yeah, that yeah. is possible because of what? Because of the fact that they use free software. So yes. how do we, we avoid that pitfall? Yeah. The re yeah, it's not just. I mean, because it, it, it's also possible. I mean, I agree. There's several reasons, that, and they use free software without contributing back to that. Yeah, exactly. In various ways, but I think also, I mean, they, they do have a bunch of. I'm, I'm not saying. Like the other reason they're able to is they have a proprietary cloud platform. If their platform were not, while they use free software within it, and that's often what they're offering, the other the, the surrounding kind of infrastructure is not open and it is proprietary, like that runs good, like Amazon's cloud. Um, and there's also kind of large economies of scale and some lock-in effects. But yeah, um, I mean that's another area where you would be pushing for more openness. Uh, by Amazon, maybe you know, like that their software were the, the software yeah. infrastructure code were more were, were open. Because what I mean is that who is making money from Linux, for example? Yes, it's not it's not, it's not Linux programs. It's not the the open source community, but it's Amazon or Google, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's that's you know uh, well, that's unfair. It, yeah, right. unfair, exactly. Yeah, it was unjust. I think the, the the question I would have is to say, rather than being like they, I mean, I'd like Linux to get more money, um, rather than it being necessary that I want them because that way, like, but I would like a remuneration rights model would be a better one. Yes, a remuneration rights approach would lead to a much, I think, fairer outcome while still rewarding innovators and creators. Do you think this is? something we can implement some way yeah i think we i think in my lifetime and i might be wrong things move i i think like the thing the way i would go strategically is that you need to start in some area you need to run a pilot of the remuneration rights model practically and you could start in medicine you could start in because medicine is a very compelling topic because not being able to treat if you can't afford to medicines because they're so expensive and then you can't treat people that's a really big motivator for government to do something and you have a much broader audience of people who care about your topic than about transparency just pure transparency of data so i think that that's one area um, that i would start i would also go and talk um to political parties and try and interest political parties in this vision because it's kind of attractive you're not saying that you're gonna, you're still gonna reward pharmaceutical companies, you're gonna still reward software companies, you're still gonna pay uh, businesses what they were being paid kind of today, but you're gonna get much more innovation and much more um, use and much more value in your society. So there's a very attractive argument, I think, to be made to a government that this is a very interesting economic policy. Like, why don't we try this out in some area? Now, it might not be all of information to start with, you might start, I'm going to start with cancer medicine, or I'm going to start with a certain kind of data, or I'm going to start with um, a certain kind of software. Um, medicines are kind of attractive because I, a lot of software it is copyrighted, but it's also just not public. Like a lot of secrecy goes on with software. Whereas with medicine and music, you kind of have to make the good open to supply it. Like you have to sort of give out the recipe to be able, you have to give, get a patent, you have to get a copyright and publicly. So I think there's, if I were going to teach, I'd be like trying to find the government or one part of my government and interest them in this idea and say, listen, this is really amazing. This allows you to get more value, treat more patients or have more people listen to music or more software developed and still generate all the money, like pay everyone like you did today. So this is like a win-win, you know, it's not... I don't, I, Often, otherwise, the debate comes a bit like we're going to take money away from these guys and give it to these. It's not a redistributive one. It's a, it's a, it's a really like win-win solution. I mean, I like to say it's like capitalism and socialism got together, had sex, and had a baby. And, and <laughs> really nice. the remuneration rights. It's like it's like capitalism. You reward innovators. They have a remuneration right that they can trade, that they can sell, that they can raise venture capital against. And you have what you could call like the social aspect, which is that everyone has access to the innovation for free. 
So you have this combination and everyone kind of contributes publicly into the pot through their tax or through, through whatever system to pay for the innovations that they have free access to. Um, so it's a very progressive, it's very progressive. Like it's very, it's very, um, it's pro poor, it's pro participation, it's in the society and it's, a, it's good for innovation and it's good for business. So that's really unusual as a policy, like the right and the left should love this policy. You know, it's like really, it's really both. And it's possible because information is costlessly copyable. If I said, hey, let's make the steel free for everyone. Let's have, let's have mo everyone can have a, a Ferrari. You know, Ferraris are free. Well, it wouldn't work because making Ferraris costs money. I can't make one Ferrari and then have a Ferrari for everyone in, in Italy. That doesn't work because steel is made of atoms. It's, it's, it's costly, very costly to make new Ferraris. Um, whereas making, you know, making copies of a digital good, like I've invented this piece of software and everyone in Italy can have it. I've invented this piece of music, written this piece of music, everyone in Italy can have it. That's possible. And that's why you can have this incredible breakthrough where it's like, you know, Adam Smith and Karl Marx are like, like have become a gay couple, you know, it's like, and have adopted a baby, which is called remuneration rights. It's really uh, like, and that's a very attractive proposition to, to parties because right now many political parties don't have very innovative economic programs. They don't really know how to address the digital age other than like build more high-speed internet. And this is a really exciting policy proposal. So that's why I would think that that's where I would really be trying to go right now or find a region or find somewhere that had the, the things you kind of need a state because it's only a state that can set up a remuneration right. You need to be in a position to create this right, like, like just like you've created a patent and that takes a state level entity. Well, Rufus, we have, I think three minutes left. And um, just a curiosity, uh, is uh, the open world your next book? Uh, is that uh, it, just a preview because I, I an open world, I mean, I, I produced a little bit your website and I stumbled upon this page, uh, a book preview about, you know, an open, an open world. I don't know is, if that's just the plan of, for any book or... Open world, I think the, the open revolution was, I, I call this building an open world. I call this area okay. making an open world. Um, so it, I'm not planning another, at the moment, I, what I would love to do is, is I think the open revolution, I think it could become a movement just like Open Knowledge Foundation was. And, and I mean, Open Knowledge Foundation will participate in this movement, but I think this movement is broader. Um, and so the one of the things I am looking for is just like the book is being translated into Italian. I think we do need to start a movement um, globally for an open world. And that's what I would, uh, that's what I would advocate for. But yeah, so that's my dream. And maybe I, I, I in a way, one of the dreams I also have is that I don't need that. I think I would love to see, uh, I certainly, there are many other amazing people who've contributed to this space. I mean, so I do want to kind of end with an acknowledgement for all, to yourself um, and to Flavia and all the people who have contributed to bring about greater openness and all the people who've inspired me from, you know, Lawrence Lessig, Jamie Boyle, um, you know, my economics, my economic professors actually, who are very supportive of this, but you know, all the people I read and thought about, there are many people who were talking about remuneration rights. Um, um, Jamie Love, who I write about in the book, who I think is an extraordinary person. And has just, I like, spent basically his whole life, um, at least the last 40 years, I would say, um, maybe 30 years really standing and, and it's you know someone who's just indefatigably worked to make a more open world and so i really there's so i mean i can't list them all but the people i would like to acknowledge and i want to acknowledge you and all the other people maybe listening and all the people who stand up to make a difference whether it's in this area or any other with climate change it never underestimate the difference that a, a person can make or a group of people can make and I am convinced that if we start really acting, you know, really starting to try and talk to people, share this idea that an open world will come about in my lifetime. And even within the next 10 years, I think there could be real movement 
on in some area like pharmaceuticals or music or software or data on this remuneration rights idea and, a, and on the open world model, the open revolution model. Um, so I really just want to end with my thanks to you, um, to Flavia, to everyone else who's made this evening possible, to everyone who's tuning in or will watch it later. Thank you for your time and attention. They are your most precious uh, thing and you've given them very generously to have listened to this and to think about it. So thank you and go out there and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Rufus. Thank you. You were very inspiring. So have a, have a nice evening. All the very best. Bye-bye.